So, um, to review the Pathfinder and the lot and the Shape Builder tool, um, we are pretty familiar with the Pathfinder tool, but it can be a little bit confusing. Um, but if we have a variety of shapes interacting with each other. Let's get a fill on that. Um, the Pathfinders tools can be used to, uh, to carve these shapes in various ways. So I can unite them where I make them into one shape. I can divide them where they're split along all the lines, right? So if I choose divide and then ungroup this, it always has to be ungrouped. I could um, put a different color on this center portion um, if I needed to for whatever reason. You can also subtract front. Um, this is particularly useful if you want to make a hole through something. Like maybe you want your pattern or your color from the garment behind this. Maybe it's a belt buckle. Um, if you want that to be uh, see-through, right, we could choose minus fronts. And now, like, if we put it on here, we would be able to see through it. Um, and we learned how to use these tools or use a similar tool, uh, the shape builder tool. I actually just used this tool because um, when I was making this kind of jacket shirts, I wanted it to be open. Um, so I still have my symbols here. I can drag out a shirt. So I'm going to break the link to the symbol so it's editable and ungroup it a couple times so it's actually editable. Um, Right, and I'm going to make the back of it really quick. This is just to review how I make backs. There's lots of ways to make the back line filled in with gray, but I always go edit, copy with the front bodice, and then edit, paste, and back. And without deselecting, I switch to the direct selection tool, and I move up the back piece. Um, so I could now give this a gray color. Um, I'll just grab the gray from this guy. Right? So with this as my basic piece, if I wanted to um, remove a front section, uh, an easy way I thought of doing that when I was fooling around building these earlier was to just draw a rectangle down the front of it. Um, it doesn't matter what color this rectangle has, it's going to disappear. But if I select it and the front bodice, I don't have the back bodice selected, um, path shape builder tool and right now when I hover over stuff it has a plus next to it and I want a minus next to it so I'm holding option this is like the only other tool that uses option <laughs> um, most tools use command and control but this tool and the flip over center tool they use options. So I am um, just subtracting and I'm actually going to drag a line through all of that, which I want all of it subtracted. And now we have the front of a shirt and it was pretty easy to make. And now they're two separate pieces and I can like lower this, give it a little bit of movement here. Um, right? So if we wanted to add something to a group, um, the example uh, so Heidi used when she was making a belt buckle. She had subtracted the circle out of it. So um, this tool, it looks like two circles on top of each other. And I'm going to option click here. Just clicking actually doesn't do anything. Option click. Um, I forgot to select both. With both of them selected, this tool, option click, it goes away. Um, but then she drew a rectangle in for this kind of um, cross piece. 
So I can not, I don't have to click anything here. I have to make sure that these are both selected before I switch to that tool. But I can just drag a line through everything I want to be joined, and there we have a solid shape. And like I could put it over here, and see through it. Um, sometimes knowing those tools, so they aren't like super necessary all the time, but they can help your workflow. Um, okay, so before we get to laying it all out, I just really quickly wanted to talk about using swatches. Um, so let's say I potentially wanted these pants to actually be jeans. Um, I can grab a swatch from the internet. Uh, or you can scan your own fabric. Um, the scanner over there, I think it's fairly self-explanatory to use, um, but getting a nice scan of this fabric, and you want something that's not too, like this has a lot of darkness on the edges, and that wouldn't make a good seamless pattern. You want something that's like kind of one color from side to side, so I'm gonna grab this guy. Um, so I'll just copy and paste it in there. And I'm going to go to Object Pattern Make, just like last semester, we're just defining it as a pattern. Um, and I can actually delete this guy now, don't need that swatch anymore. Because here he is in this, in this pattern box, um, in my swatch box, so I can apply that pattern to him. Um, who remembers how to scale patterns down on the garments. Come on, you guys remember. Right click. <laughs> Hold on, how do I get this? There we go. Come on, how do I make this pattern smaller? One of you must remember. Yes. You would have made it smaller before. That would have worked perfectly. There is a way to scale it now that it's already a pattern. Yes. Yeah, Callie knows. Yeah. So I'm trying to select this whole thing. There we go. Um, right click, or you can always go to Object, Transform, Scale. And in this scale thing, right now it's just scaling the whole garments. But if we uncheck transform objects, it transforms just the pattern. So I can click in here and I can like get it exactly, exactly the right size for me um, and hit OK. OK, so that's, I'll do it again. Right click or object, transform, scale, and you want to uncheck this box that says transform objects and giving it a good preview is always good because if transform objects is checked it's going to scale that guy too did not do the these guys okay so all i did was grab a swatch we can do it with anything we can do it with corduroy corduroy Oh god. Oh well that got me there. Um, and we can grab, you know, one of these. Maybe maybe this one. Um, paste. And then you can go edit to find pattern. Sorry, object pattern make. I'm getting it mixed up with Photoshop like I do. Um, again, you could have scaled it down beforehand, but I did not. That's okay. Um, and we can put it on this kind of, I guess it's kind of a jacket. I probably wouldn't wear this in a corduroy, but um, you can just grab it over there. Right click, transform scale, and then we just want to uncheck transform patterns. Um, now we have a nice corduroy texture. So um, a few people ended up using that right away last class. Um, ended up putting, you know, plaid textures if you need a plaid 
Um, it's kind of hard to design a good plaid, so you can just grab a plaid from the internet and, and define the pattern in there. Okay, that is that. Um, swatches, oh, what did I do? Oh, it's just like, oh God, I don't know. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Does that make sense? Swatches and then the, um, the Pathfinder tool and everything. We don't have a ton to go over today. You guys have questions on anything else before I move on? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly the same thing. Um, I don't know, like, if I drag in this picture and it still has the X through it, can I just drag it in there? No. Like, it has to be embedded. Remember this guy? So if it has the X through it, you have to click embed first, and then we can drag it in there. Where if you paste, it's never going to have that X through it. Yeah, but just dragging it in there, exact same thing. We can now apply this beautiful pattern to those pants. Um, <laughs> uh, what else? Um, that was a very good question. That is the other way to define things. The reason I ended up, I used to teach pattern making that way, like where we just dragged into the swatches, and I ended up teaching it by going to object pattern make instead, because like you end up applying that pattern to your swatch sometimes, and it just gets confusing. I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Yeah, I just, Yeah, so images in patterns are okay um, as long as they're embedded. God, don't save that. Um, uh, all right. Yeah, other, any other questions? Okay, so when we, when we print these, we don't want to print each 10 looks on their own page because that would be unwieldy in your portfolio. And it would also be expensive, right? Um, it would be more. But uh, we can combine these onto, uh, onto one page. And that's what we want you to do. We don't want all 10 on one page because that would be very small. But somewhere between two and four or two and five on each page um, would be a good amount. So first off, oh, I'll delete that guy. Um, first off, I'm gonna shut off my um, women or my croquis. I don't want any, I don't want any croquis involved in this. Um, flats are never displayed with their croquis, even though we use that for proportions. They're displayed um, on their own. And I actually did have some examples of some fashion flat collections here. So uh, the various ways that they've kind of laid these out. So you always have front and back really tight to each other. Um, you wouldn't want, like if all of your front and backs are left and right, like you wouldn't want to put suddenly a front and the back like on top and bottom of each other. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but you can see how uh, how they've kind of laid these out all on one page. Um, okay. So I'm going to start by grouping these in their separate little files because I actually I haven't made them all on their own layers or anything. Um, so just selecting them all and right click group. Um, and we want to get more specific for these guys, so. Do you want to have like a top separate You do, and I have failed to draw them that way. Um, I was trying to demonstrate that we do want to separate them. Um, here's a pro tip, I might have mentioned this before, but where I've separated these cuffs from my shirt, if I select them both and I want to get them lined up again perfectly, this is kind of subtle. 
But if I start on this anchor, and because I have smart guides on, I can see that I'm hovering over an anchor here. But if I click and drag on that anchor with the black selection tool, I'm still moving everything. But when I line up with another anchor point, my black selection tool is going to turn white. And that's just to let me know that I'm perfectly over another anchor point. So if I come up here and line it up with the appropriate anchor point, see it turns white? Not white. White. Not white. White. And I can release. And now I know it's perfectly lined up. That's just a quick pro tip. Um, so I'll just group these. So once you have everything um, once you have everything grouped, we have a lot of flexibility in these. You guys can be creative. Um, you can use your best judgments. Um, you don't have to put a background or anything on these. Um, but if you... Uh, you should be you should be designing them in a way or laying them out in a way that is pleasing to you. Um, create a group. Sorry. I, yeah. No, this is it's fine. Um, for today, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, it's totally cool. They don't have to be on separate pages today but they can be if they are already. Um, there we go. Um, but we do, we definitely do want them on like more, uh, you want more than one flats or more than one look on each page. Um, and looks should be together, so like the tops and bottoms should probably never be separated onto separate pages, um, if that makes sense. All right, last one. And so it would be very nice for these um, if all of your flats were still kind of proportionally the same size. So I can't fit all of these onto the same page right now at this scale. Um, and if I started trying to like arrange them over here and then I started scaling them, things might get confusing. Like I could end up with one look really large and one look really small. And we kind of want all of these to look like they could fit on the same paper doll. Um, so I'm actually just going to grab them all and scale them. Did I, did I actually scale anything? No. I'm going to grab them all and I'm going to scale them down at once, like this. I'm holding shift, so they're all scaling at once. And I'm kind of going to leave them smallish. And that's just, a nice, that's just a nice way to know that you are, um, that you have them all at the same size. I guess like giving it a good eyeball is probably not unacceptable. Um, so, when we're laying these out, it's okay for front and backs to overlap. Um, I prefer my back to actually be behind though, so I'm going to do right click, arrange, center back. Um, but as long as your front isn't covering any sort of important information on the back, then it's okay for them to be um, touching like this. And they actually, front and backs should be very close to one another. Um, you should also try to keep your outfits, like try to make it pretty obvious which garments go together into outfits. Um, it could be, it could get confusing and it could be kind of hard to tell um, in certain cases. Oh, I apparently did group these. Um, So, in some cases, um, I really like to put a drop shadow on these. So your objects have to be grouped for drop shadow to work. I'm going to ungroup this one and I'll show you the difference. Um, so select both of these and 
drop shadow lives under effect, stylized drop shadow, and we can check preview. Um, and you can see that for the grouped one, it put the drop shadow behind the object, and for the ungrouped one, it gave every like individual line a drop shadow, um, which doesn't look good. Uh, so I'm actually going to hit cancel, and I'll do it again. There are all of those options um, on drop shadow, effect stylized drop shadow. Uh, we could change how thick, how thick the drop shadow is, how dark it is, um, what direction it goes in, all that good stuff. Um, but it, I just think it, it really helps your the garments look um, very flat, and I think that that can be nice. And then it also helps set them apart from each other. So where these are overlapping, putting a nice drop shadow on that uh, can um, can really just demonstrate these levels well. So if you would like to, you are also welcome to put words on um, on these pages. These can be fairly creative layouts. They don't need to be just like straight shooting um, uh, displays of your clothes. Um, although they can be. This, this project is about the language of the flats and that's the very important part. And you don't have to go crazy trying to get this to be a beautiful, beautiful layout or anything. Um, although it, I just it is an option, um, and it should look nice to you. Oh, I made a mistake in these. Huh. So if things are already grouped, I've, I've probably mentioned this, but you can double click on them to access a, um, a particular portion of it and to edit it like normal. So double clicking enters isolation mode, which you probably enter accidentally all the time like I do. Um, but just like that. Accidentally double clicking. So I've put two each on the same page here. Um, and these aren't tech packs, but it can be nice. Um, you could optionally do some kind of um, highlighting of certain details. So let me just get the drop shadow on the rest of these that don't have it. Um, so in tech packs, you guys know what tech packs are? Can anyone explain it to me? Um, so we're designing flats, which get sent to the factory. But when you send it to the factory, you don't just send them um, the flats alone, just like on a blank piece of paper. You send them a tech pack. Um, so on a tech pack, they're probably more than one page, but they're going to have specific callouts and um, measurements and details in them. Um, so the the person who is using the um, who is using the tech pack knows like exactly the correct distances for everything to be. This one is really nice. Um, here, can I get it any bigger? Uh, let's get a large. Um, so they have measurements on here, uh, but in some cases they have a details page with um, some callouts. So like here where the, um, I think this is some sort of pull zipper or something, they have like a callout and then a zoomed in version of it. Um, same down here. This one is great. So here we have um, a zoomed in version of 
this section, you know, of the ribbing at the bottom, of the hem, of the detail on the zipper. Um, so the way we can do this in, in Illustrator is actually really quick. So we have learned about clipping masks um, briefly. And uh, let's see what elements of this, none of these are particularly detailed. Um, so maybe we want to draw attention to this closure um, on the back of the dress. We can copy and paste this dress. And I'm going to make it bigger in a minute, but first I'm actually going to draw around like a circle around the call out or a square or whatever type of call out you want to use. So with the clipping mask, the object that is in the front of the stack is going to become the crop. It's going to, it's going to crop all of the other images, like all of this extra stuff is going to hide behind that circle and only the stuff in the circle is going to be visible. So with all of that selected and my circle on the front, clipping mask objects, clipping mask make. And there she goes, she hides behind the circle. Um, and now I can make this really big. God, it's going to crash my computer. There it is. Um, so when I scaled it up, none of the none of the paths scaled, and like that's fine. It looks it looks fine, and it does actually look like I've kind of zoomed in on the detail. But if you ever want to make something. Um, and like keep the paths the same proportion, right? Like they're thicker on this version. If we go right click, transform scale, instead of dragging it around, um, we can just check off scale stroke and effects. And we can actually leave this at 100. Like we don't need to do anything to it right now. Um, although we can, like we could scale it and the, the stroke and effects will stay the same. Um, but we can actually just hit OK. And these act as settings for your free transform mode. So now that I've checked that and I hit OK, when I scale it out here, it should stay proportional. I really hope it does. There it goes. So the right click transform scale settings, they can affect your like free transform settings for scale stroke and effect. Probably for scale corners too. Um, okay. If I want to put a black ring around this, I can't just, maybe I can. Can I just click on it and give it stroke up here? No. It doesn't seem to like that. Maybe it did. Things are running slow. Yeah, it tried to scale the whole um, whole situation here. Uh, God. So if I want one just around the outside, I just have to do this double click. And now I'm in isolation mode. And I can click on the outside path um, and apply the stroke to it. Um, and then escape isolation mode. So I have a nice moment of detail and I could draw a line from that detail to this circle so they would know where it is on the garment. Um, that's an option. You could also potentially add text to your garment. So this, this stuff is not inspired by my um, Puerto Rico vacation but uh, if your collection had a title, you could throw that in here in some sort of dynamic way. Um, vacation tune. Uh, but again, all of this is optional at this point. All of this kind of, you should be trying to design a dynamic board, like a dynamic display board. Um, but really at this point, it's about, it's about the flats. Uh, we just don't want 10 flats like all across your, 
your whole page. Uh, okay. Questions on that, on layouts or anything right now? Um, before I let you guys go, um, or go to break, I wanted to talk about print color. So, um, most of you are probably familiar with this from, um, from last semester, but the print colors that we see on the screen are not, um, or the colors that we see on the screen are not the colors that will come out of the printer. They're, they will be potentially kind of close, um, but not perfect. And I just wanted to do a demo, so I'm just throwing a few color swatches there, and then we'll print these. So, um, mm -hmm. If you wanted to. No, but like in the is that part of like a collection that we are gonna end up revising or is this like the actual This is the end game for okay. this this uh, project. This project is totally due in its entirety next week, um, which is the week before spring break. I did forget to intro something though. Um, so I'm gonna tell these to print, but then I'm going to I have another lesson that I forgot about that I said I was going to do, and it's an important one. Um, so at, colors are not required, but they are highly recommended because it looks great in your portfolio. They will be required for the next project. But I'm going to show you a cheap way to do colors right now. It's, we're going to be, it's the, it's the easiest way to do colors, but it makes, well, I'll get there. I'm going to print these, sorry. Um, then we are going to do colors using the, um, the live paint tool. So uh, file print, sorry. Burp, burp, burp. Wait for it to... Okay. Um, well, we'll see if that actually comes out. So I wanted to, these are some flats from last class. Um, So someone worked hard making these flats, uh, and they look very good when they are handed in. They're just uh, they're just black and white, right? Um, but like over here, she hasn't made a closed shape, right? And this is a common mistake with early flat makers that we we don't make closed shapes. So if we went to put color on this we would get some weird moments, right? These guys actually have a fill on them and they don't need a fill. That's what's happening there. But because this shape isn't closed, we're getting an awkward line through it. That makes sense. It's part of the reason why color is hard at this stage of um, flats making. I just redid what I, yeah. Um, so, we can get around this, and we did touch on this um, with one of the So Heidi videos, but if I have this selected, um, and I have made a point here of making sure that her shoulder seams go all the way to the edge. If it's important to me to have different colored arms, I need to make sure that these go all the way to the edge. And then I'm going to grab the live paint tool. And the live paint tool lives under the shape builder tool that we've been hearing so much about. Live paint bucket. Um, I've made a mistake. You have to have the whole 
object selected first. And I'm going to try it with the dashed lines on. Um, uh, so I've included the dashed lines in this, but I'm not sure how much of a difference they're going to make. So live paint bucket tool, and we click on this. We just click once. And what that's done is it's converted it into a live paint object. So now I can grab a color from over here or anywhere, and I can fill these various areas. Even though this is built differently than where I'm filling in, I can um, I can just click and and like fill in my colors like uh, more like a Photoshop paint bucket tool, right? All right, I'm going to do it again. Over here, this guy, we know it doesn't fill correctly. Um, and we want our sleeves to be a different color. So I am actually going to, hold on, I'll get rid of the fill. There we go. And we select all of it. You have to have it selected. And then switch to the live paint bucket and click on it. And it's going to make it into a live paint group, which is its own kind of new entity. It's, it's weirdly uneditable after this. So what's key before you start using this paint tool, what's key is to make sure you're all done. Because editing it after you've used the live paint tool is nigh on impossible. Um, so we want to we can now just uh, choose some colors option turns my paint bucket tool into the eyedropper tool so I can come over here and grab my colors option eyedropper tool um, so I can kind of like get in here and I can like double click on stuff and edit stuff, um, but it's it just gets kind of weird and it can be hard to edit things. Um, particularly what we were facing last class when people actually got into this and they started using it during class um, is if they had taken any time to put in any sort of, um, I'm sorry, I was trying to find one really quick, but I'll just adapt, ah, here, this one will be good. So uh, she had taken the time to put in these ruffles, but if we select all of this and then choose the live paint tool and click on it, um, it doesn't like brushes. We can hit OK, but see what it did? She had put tapered brushes on all of these. This is, did you, so, and so those were all, they were all pointy, and when we turned it into a live paint bucket tool, they got all square and we can't like we can't edit them so we go in here and we come up and we try to place it on it and it doesn't work because it's a live paint tool or object it's a live paint object it's been transformed into one so it doesn't accept any sort of brushes anymore so what Jen um, and others ended up having to do was um, grab these shapes without any any shape that's applied that has a brush applied to it. So she specifically had to like choose around these guys. For some reason it doesn't mind the dashes. I think that because the dashes are applied through like the stroke panel and not through like a any of the other panels, I think that these are okay, but also some people lost them like when they converted them into live paint. So I don't know, um, but most people were okay leaving those on. Uh, but anyway, you just want to select around your anything with a taper on it if you happen to do that. But we can just convert this into a live paint tool. Gorgeous. Um, you can, now that it's live paint, you don't have to like define it as a live paint tool every time. I can just grab the tool and come back in here. Um, 
So yeah, my, my gathers have disappeared, but that's just a stacking issue. So arrange, send to back, and they'll be, there they are. Um, so that's live paint, which, although it's much better and uh, much easier in the long run to make closed shapes that allow you to apply color to them, um, you, this is an option if you've built them kind of sloppily, which happens. Uh, Sometimes I make mistakes and the live paint tool is the only thing that will solve my problems. You can pour um, uh, swatches in there too. If I had a swatch pattern um, in my paint, I have my paint bucket tool. I could select one of these swatches and pour it in there. That works just the same. Um, or any of my defined swatches from like the internet. Anything else? Uh, the patterns? I think so, let's try it. So if we right click transform scale and we uncheck transform objects, yeah, they do. Um, so, so that's, that's good, and I, I think it'll be worthwhile to, for those of you who haven't done color to try to get color on there um, for, for your portfolios mostly. Um, but uh, I understand that at this point we're really just trying to learn the language of flats, and I don't want you guys to like be so panicked about color, but it would be good. Um, cool. Uh, other questions? Live paints, um, layouts, any of that? As far as sending a color. So after, um, after our little mini crit, after break, we will do layout. So you can be, you can either choose to, some people chose to color their flats and then some people just started laying them out depending on what they wanted. Um, but that is, that is the goal. The goal should be, like, when you leave class, you should be as close to being ready to print as possible. Because your homework tonight is to print these and to, um, to bring your design board as well. So your inspiration board should also be printed. The whole project should be printed out for next week. Um, and I did want to try to print these. I don't know why it didn't work last time. But um, just a, as another note on the color, um, I mean, we'll see this if this ever prints out, but you guys will know also from last semester that um, the color that comes out of the printer can be extremely dissimilar than the color on the screen. In fact, the color from this screen to that screen is different to the screen I'm projecting on. Like, it's totally different. Um, professionals have these fancy color tools that they press against their computer and it tells them the exact color and then they match that to the exact color on a printed page. So like professionals have ways to know that what they're looking at on the screen is what they will print. Um, and that's an advantage that they have that we do not. So we should probably run sample prints if we're worried about color. Um, because it's annoying if you like print out all of your pages and then you realize that one of the colors is like too greenish or whatever. Um, so it's nice, like we could make a little sample page of all of these colors that I've used um, in the in this project and just print that little sample page. You know, just a way to just save save a little money. Um, okay. That, that's everything, I think. Do you guys feel good? Okay. Um, all right, let's take a break until 3.15-ish, uh, and then we can come back and do the crits, okay? Mini crits. 